Good evening, everyone. This is Superintendent White. We are going to start our Roanoke City Public Schools School Safety Summit in about 10 minutes. We'll see you soon.
Good evening again, everyone. Superintendent White here. We're gearing up for our Run-Up City Public Schools School Safety Summit. We'll see you in about five minutes. Good evening and welcome to the Runnock City Public Schools School Safety Summit. I'm Berlita White, Superintendent of Runnock City Public Schools, and I am grateful to be joined this evening by a panel of local, regional, and national school safety experts, as well as school system and city officials 
who will share their experience and expertise with us this evening. This is an important conversation, and I want to thank everyone who is tuning in this evening. Before we begin, I would just like to say how appreciative we are for the nearly 200 parents and guardians, as well as students, RCPS staff, community members, and partner agencies who took time to provide input prior to this summit. Your input will help to guide our discussion this evening. I know that as a parent, a teacher, and as a community member, you want to hear from the experts how we can move forward in the best interest of our children. That is why this discussion this evening is so important. This year has been difficult, and not just because of COVID-19. Discipline rates in school divisions across the region and the nation are at an all-time high as a result of student behavior. Occurrences of students who have brought guns and other look-alike weapons on school grounds have also increased. We know that we are not alone in our challenges, but we, like you, are concerned, as I know many in our community are. This is why I felt so strongly that we needed to convene the experts who are around the table with us this evening, and we must learn from others and ensure that we are not just reacting, but instead taking a research-based, comprehensive approach to school safety. We've heard the call for metal detectors and for bag checks and clear bags and even no bags. Others are advocating for more community programs and supports for students and accountability for parents whose children are involved in acts of violence or who bring weapons to school. We will dig into all of this and in just a few minutes we will get into that entire conversation. But first, we will meet our experts. Before we do that, though, it is my pleasure to introduce Mrs. Lutheria Smith, the chair of our Roanoke City School Board. Mrs. Smith. Thank you, Mrs. White, and good evening, everyone. On behalf of my colleagues on the school board, I would like to thank all of you for joining us this evening, both at home and our experts who are assembled here tonight for this difficult but really necessary discussion. I know I speak for my fellow board members who are joining virtually uh, in saying that the collective wisdom gathered here this evening is vitally important as we consider all our options. I read a quote from an unknown author recently that said safety does not occur by accident. Truer words were never spoken especially as it relates to ensuring that our students and staff have a safe environment in which to learn and work. So while it would be uh, easy to react, putting in place what seem to be simple solutions, we know that is not the best or most responsible course of action. So I am here tonight on behalf of the school board to listen and to learn so we are able to make thoughtful, informed decisions that are in the long-term best interest of our students, our teachers, and all staff in Roanoke City Public Schools. I applaud our superintendent for her leadership in uh, researching the best options and for her team's efforts to host this evening's summit. And thank you all again for being here tonight and for sharing your valuable experience and expertise with us and your partnership in our efforts um, as these are most important uh, mm -hmm. next steps for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Smith. You raise an excellent point. We must all listen and consider what we hear tonight. It is going to take all of us working together to make real change for our students. Many of us may be coming to this discussion this evening with our own ideas for solutions. I encourage everyone to listen with an open mind. I don't believe that there is solely one approach that will affect long-term and lasting change. Instead, by focusing on what the research tells us and what the experience of others who have walked this path before us and studied the outcomes, we can make the best decisions for our students for our staff and for our city. Now I'd like to take a moment and introduce our panel for this evening's discussion. So first, I would like to recognize from our Roanoke City Public Schools team, 
uh, Mr. Chris Perkins, he's our Chief Operations Officer. And I'll ask everyone to raise their hands as, uh, as I introduce you. Mr. Perkins has been with RCPS since 2018. Prior to joining RCPS, he served as the CEO of For Harmony Senior Services. He retired as Chief of the Roanoke Police Department in 2016 after 24 years of service to the Roanoke community. He brings a wealth of knowledge, leadership, and experience to RCPS, including having been appointed to the Public Safety Work Group for Governor McDonald's School and Campus Safety Task Force in 2013. So thank you, Mr. Perkins, for being here. Next, our C CAO, Archie Freeman, is here. Mr. Freeman joined RCPS 20 years ago and was appointed as Chief Academic Officer in December of 2020. Before coming to central office, Mr. Freeman served in numerous school-based leadership positions, including as principal of William Fleming High School for nine years. He was also principal of Woodrow Wilson Middle School and was assistant principal of both Woodrow Wilson Middle School and William Fleming High School. Mr. Freeman brings a wealth of school-based leadership experience to our conversation this, this evening, so thank you for being here. Next, we have Mrs. Haley Poland. Mrs. Poland is the Assistant Superintendent of Equity and Student Services for Roanoke City Public Schools. In this role, she oversees special education, counseling, student services, and uh, she, where she also oversees student discipline. Mrs. Poland has been with Roanoke City Public Schools for seven and a half years. Prior to coming to RCPS, she served in Roanoke County Public Schools as a therapeutic counselor. We are also fortunate to have with us this evening members of our Roanoke City Council. So first I'd like to introduce our Vice Mayor, Patricia White Boyd. Vice Mayor White Boyd has, was elected to City Council in January 2021, having served since 2019. She is with us this evening on behalf of Mayor Lee. Thank you so much for joining us. I'd also like to introduce Councilman Joe Cobb, um, who is also joining us. Councilman Cobb has served on City Council since 2018. He currently serves as the chair of the Gun Violence Prevention Commission and brings valuable insight to this evening's conversation, given the recent community surveys done by the commission. Thank you so much for being here. I'd also like to introduce Mr. Chris Roberts. Mr. Roberts joined the City of Roanoke as the Youth and Gang Violence Prevention Coordinator since September of 2021. In his role, Mr. Roberts coordinates activities and programs between city departments, community groups, stakeholders, and agencies in the awareness, suppression, intervention, and prevention of youth and gang-related activity. Thank you so much for being here. Also from the City of Roanoke, joining us is the Chief of Police, Sam Roman. Chief Roman was appointed in March 2020 after serving 28 years in law enforcement, of which 25 were in Roanoke. Chief Roman is a valuable partner for RCPS as school resource officers are an important part of the RCPS team and play a critical role in school safety. Thank you, Chief, for being here. Next to Chief Roman, we have joining us Chief Deputy Colonel Chuck Ferguson, who is here on behalf of Sheriff Hash. Uh, Colonel Ferguson joined the Roanoke City Sheriff's Department in 1985. During his 37 years, he has served as supervisor in multiple uh, divisions within the department and has been the commander of the tactical team for 23 years. The Sheriff's Department's commitment to RCPS has been invaluable, including the increases in SROs assigned to our schools. Thank you, Colonel, for being here. Next, we have Ms. Heather Gunn. Ms. Gunn is a licensed professional counselor and is the community-based services director of the Child, Youth, and Family Division at Blue Ridge Behavioral Health Care. Ms. Gunn is also a parent and has children who attend RCPS. Thank you so much for being here. Also joining us this evening, we have uh, to provide a regional perspective is Dr. Gerard Lawson. Dr. Lawson is a professor in the School of Education at Virginia Tech. He has been a disaster mental health volunteer with the American Red Cross since 2001 and has supported numerous national, state, and local disasters. He was instrumental in helping to coordinate the counseling response to the tragic shootings at Virginia Tech in 2007. 
and he is the author of Virginia Tech's Disaster Behavioral Health Plan. He has helped many institutions prepare for crisis response and works frequently with counselors who have responded, providing debriefing and supportive services. His focus is on building resilience in individuals, including counselors, and communities that are affected by disasters. Thank you so much for being here. And last but certainly not least, I would like to introduce Mr. Ken Trump, as Mr. Trump would say, no relation. No relation. <laughs> uh, Mr. Trump is president of the National School Safety and Security Services, a Cleveland-based national consulting firm specializing in school security and emergency preparedness training. School security assessments, school emergency planning, consultations, crisis school safety communications, litigation consulting and expert witness support, and related school safety and crisis consulting services. Mr. Trump is one of the nation's leading school safety experts with more than 30 years of frontline public and private, urban, suburban, and rural security experience um, working with school and safety officials from all 50 states and internationally. Mr. Trump also has experience working with Roanoke City Public Schools, having visited our school division multiple times, especially over, not just recently, but also over the past 15 years. So it's good to have him back. Thank you, Mr. Trump, for being here. Good to be back. So I want to thank each of you again for joining us to help guide our path forward. And because I know that we have a lot to get to, and I want to thank our community members again for providing the input. Your input is how we've developed the discussion points for tonight. So I just want to thank you to all of our, our parents, teachers, principals, community members uh, who have added value to this conversation because your suggestions uh, are how we have crafted our, our questions for tonight. So we're going to jump right in. We have a lot to get to. We had various themes based on your feedback, so we want to get started right away. So let's just get to the, the first issue that, um, that we saw in that theme, the, one of our main themes uh, as, that we got from the feedback. To begin this evening, I'd like for us to zoom out a bit and look at what's happening outside of our city. Uh, we've read about increases in discipline numbers and occurrences, the occurrences of weapons being brought to schools in Virginia and across the nation, including uh, Lynchburg and Appomattox and Henrico and Newport News and Alexandria, as well as districts across the nation. Research and current events suggest that we are not alone here in Roanoke City with some of the behaviors that we're seeing. So I would like to start with our experts and talk about these trends and what the data is telling us about the cause of the increase in the behavior issues and mental health needs that, we, that we're seeing among some of our students. And so I think it would be good to have a national and a local um, perspective on this. So Dr. Lawson, I'm going to start with you, and then Ms. Gunn, I'll ask you if you could also chime in from a local perspective. So Dr. Lawson? Yeah. <coughs> thank you. I, um, first, I guess thank you for inviting me to be part of this um, great panel and a, a really important topic. Um, I, I think that early on it's important to acknowledge that, that schools are essentially a, a microcosm of the community that they're situated in. So when you see challenges in a community, when a community is under stress, you're gonna see that show up in the schools as well. And that seems like it, it may be common sense in some ways, but it's important for us to, to think broadly about what's happening in the schools as well. Um, one of the things that we do know from the research though is that um, there are increases, particularly since the pandemic, there have been increases in the rates of depression and anxiety among students across the Commonwealth. Um, Virginia Tech helps to support the, the annual school climate survey and, and we see those numbers year after year and can see a difference in those depression and anxiety sorts of rates. Um, if you imagine how students themselves tried to manage the pandemic, um, many of them had their own stressors sort of built in. Their schooling was disrupted. Um, as they tried to get back into school, sometimes in some places that was unsuccessful and, and created more stress. 
um, when they finally did get back to, to learning in school, um, it had been a two-year absence and having to relearn how to, to be part of this school community and, and part of the, the work that needs to, to happen there. Um, how do I make sense of all of that again? I think one of the other challenges is that we see that during the pandemic in particular, kids were still seeking that socialization and oftentimes turned to social media for that kind of socialization. And that can quickly take a young person to a pretty dark place. Um, the, the social media um, atmosphere is not necessarily a, a positive and encouraging one. Um, add to that the stressors that their families were under. Um, if that meant uh, underemployment or unemployment, if their jobs were disrupted as a result of the pandemic, their financial stresses, all of those things that kids were being exposed to vicariously, and it will show up again and again and again until they feel as if they're settled and able to um, do what they can to, to begin to sort of put things back to, together. Um, at the same time, during the pandemic, um, there was a change in the political climate. Um, there was a change in, in the discussion across the country. Um, many of our national leaders have been poor role models for how we should conduct ourselves and um, how you treat people with respect and understanding and compassion has become secondary in a lot of cases. And so I think that one of the things that we can do is to begin to, to address some of those changes and really challenge some of the narratives that emerge where our, you know, our talented teachers were being accused of not wanting to work or glorified babysitters or those sorts of things has a damaging impact and kids hear that message and are going to respond in their own way to that disrespect um, and, and may follow through on that. So I think what we've seen is a period of increasing pressure for a couple of years and now an outlet for that pressure. Um, and what is unfortunately happening is that now that students are back in school, that outlet of their pressure is showing up with these, um, the poor lessons that they've learned over the, poor, the past two years are getting in the way of the lessons they should be learning in school under normal circumstances. Thank you for that. I mean, that you raised some uh, really interesting points with the increases in depression and anxiety and the social media influences and kind of the, the um, media influences overall. So um, then how do we have kids, how do we help them deal with those pressures? Ms. Ganya or Dr. Lawson, do you want to tag I'll team? This will be that. a free flowing sure. conversation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, as a product of Roanoke City Public Schools, having gone through this system that we're speaking of myself, and then watching my children go through this system, it's been hard. And as a parent, scary. So as a mental health professional, the focus is for me really broad. It's, it's in my home, it's in my face, and it's also at work every day. Before the pandemic, my colleagues and I talked about seeing an increase in youth seeking mental health services. There used to be an ebb and a flow through the year. When school started back and behavior started to be seen in the schools, go to counseling became the resolve, and usually that could address the issues. Summertime, you may not see as many kids coming in. We weren't seeing those ebbs and flows before the pandemic. So we were noticing that, and I'm assuming definitely the increase in social media and technology were some of the things that we were talking about were influencing our kids prior to. Mm -hmm. So there was that balance of them having access to supports in the community that they may or may not been getting in their homes or in schools. Mm -hmm. That was ripped away. And our kids were hurting. They were alone, they were isolated, they were terrified. So the idea of us looking at safety now, if you look at internal safety as a youth, they were not getting that need met. And the parents, us, me, the caregivers, the guardians, we were experiencing <coughs> similar things. Feeling scared, not having safety, not having access to our supports and our networks. So if we're not able to have our needs met, how can we meet the needs of our kids and then send them off to school? That wasn't happening. They were in home for safety of their human bodies at the same time. Unfortunately, it did damage their emotional ability to regulate, their ability to 
seek out those safe spaces that they may or may not have had in their homes. So oftentimes we're, we're, we talk about, um, I, I know in Rummet City Public Schools we're, we're focused on prevention, restoration, and logical consequences. And it sounds like from this, this feedback that more time spent on the, not just the prevention, but the restoration piece, teaching, it's almost having, if I'm hearing you correctly, it's a reteaching of those um, social, beho emotional behaviors um, that we're expecting. Yeah, I think definitely the ability for us to have compassion and grace for our kids, for each other, to promote a system of healing across all of our systems and not just it being the responsibility of the school or the parents. Everyone, every single one of us in the city that touches a youth to go into that youth's life with the intention of healing, of being a safe space. And then you have with the climate, um, political climate being a lot more difficult for those students of color and those students with language barriers to seek safe spaces. Mm -hmm. So paying special attention to them because their experience was a little different. So I think just being able to focus in on where we see our children hurting and to not shy away from it and to lean into it and be that pillar of security for them. You know, a lot of this is coming up for us as well as we're um, thinking about the events that have transpired over the last um, several weeks here in Rummet City. We know that we had um, a school bus kind of get caught in the crossfire. Uh, so when we talk about those safe spaces, not just in school, but outside of school, and um, incidents where we've had children bring weapons or look-alike weapons um, to school, that, that sparks fear. And, um, and, and people have a lot of anxiety about that. So we, we, we heard through um, a lot of the feedback and the common themes about um, what to do, how to address that type of fear so that our schools can be safe spaces. So one of the things that we notice again, um, that the topic of metal detectors uh, comes up quite frequently when, whenever we're talking about um, how to keep schools safe. And I have to say some uh, of the feedback that we see, some uh, people are, are adamantly for and others are adamantly against. And so I just wanna pull out some of the direct quotes uh, so that we can kind of hear our, um, our community's voices in this. So one comment from the input we, we received prior to the summit stated, metal detectors should be mandatory in every school, including elementary school. Also, administrators should be given the right to wand anyone who sets the metal detector off. No one should be allowed on school grounds who has not gone through the metal detector. So that was one comment. Then another comment said, invest in counselors, mentors, social workers, and SROs who build good relationships with students. Violence is prevented when students have trusted adults to talk to, not by having metal detectors that create long lines where students are vulnerable and the culture of the school is forever diminished. End quote there. So, Mr. Trump, I'm going to turn to you as our uh, national expert on, uh, one of our national experts on the panel. Um, as these examples kind of showcase, we have varying opinions on the use of metal detectors. Um, would you please kind of provide your insight as to what the research tells us about the impact of metal detectors on school safety? Sure. Academically, the research is rather scant. There's not a great deal of research on physical security, which translated means hardware, equipment, cameras, uh, metal detectors, uh, access control. There's a common sense element to it. We don't leave our houses open when we go, so we want to limit and control access to, to that. But uh, the, the research that exists, counterintuitive to what many would think, there is some research emerging that says that uh, the presence of metal detectors uh, could actually create a perception of a less safe environment and increase the anxiety of the kids. A little counterintuitive to what you would think, but they see this and they think, I must be in greater danger being in this building because this is happening. 
emerging research. From 30 years of experience um, and academically, I can say that the, the research is stronger saying that the response and a proper approach is a comprehensive approach to school safety, where you're dealing with prevention, intervention and student supports, reasonable, effectively applied security measures, and collaboration across the community with really the people that you've assembled at the table. We know that a comprehensive approach works. The research shows it. The research also shows, and the experience shows, very easy to say, very hard to implement because you have a lot of different agencies, you have the resource allocation limitations, and just the dynamics of coordinating all of these while, in the meantime, you're providing education services to, and to kids. So that's what we know on that end. We're in a fast food society. Uh, from a practical end of things, after high profile incidents where you do have weapons uh, incidents in schools with gun discharge, weapons confiscation, and elsewhere around the country, active shooter cases, which I've worked on in, from a number of perspectives, we automatically see that tendency for that fast food, I want a quick answer, I want more cameras, I want metal detectors, I want to see that visible, tangible thing. And, and we all are overloaded. Our attention spans are probably down in many cases to seven seconds on an average day because we're moving to the next thing, the impact of our electronic devices, both kids and adults. So that's a quick fix. But the question that I ask is, is that effective or is it security theater? Are we creating the perception of security, but does it really make us safer? And the bigger question goes exactly to what your parent feedback shows, uh, because what you captured is exactly what we've heard. I've been into a school system where a kid brought an AK-47 to school, fired a couple rounds in the hallway, and committed suicide in the hallway, uh, in the hallway between class changes. I've worked in a school district after a kid brought a tree saw and machete to school and attacked kids in his uh, first period Spanish class. And I've worked with those community groups afterwards, and what you described is very, very consistent with the quotes. You have one track of thought that says, if it would save one life, spend every dollar that you have and put in all the equipment that you can. You have the other school of thought who said, I don't want my kids in a prison-like environment. We need to think of the overall psychological impact. And my questions kind of go down the middle of those very polarized opinions. My question is, what would it look like and how would it work? And I know Mr. Freeman's going to, to talk about that. But if you think about it, schools are community centers. And there's no better place that I know that in, than having worked in uh, Roanoke City Public Schools with your rec centers and your community use of facilities, in addition to athletics and performing arts and all the things that you want to offer for kids, your town hall meetings with your community officials. Schools are a part of the community. So if you're going to do the metal detectors, for example, my question is, what would that look like? How would it work? You would, uh, we see some schools around the country that do it only during the school day, and then they turn them off when the kids go home. And if you want to come in in the evening, you come in when people are having athletic practices, performing arts practices, shows, you put something in the school, leave it overnight, come through the metal detector clean in the next morning, and you still have the outcome that didn't solve the problem that you want. So the question is, if you're going to do it, do you have the ability to do it 24-7? Or is it part of the school and community culture and climate where everyone, mama, papa, grandpa, grandma, anybody in a wheelchair, public officials, anyone who comes to a meeting, are you going to be able to run that? And the cost of the metal detectors, as Mr. Perkins will tell you, is the, the cost of the equipment is relatively uh, a minor issue and the big thing, it's the staffing of those. Where are you going to find people? Who's going to run those? Are you going to also get a, um, a, a x-ray machine to check their bags? Um, are you going to run this all through throughout the evening? So it's a huge thought and as we talked about, um, and one of my big things is unintended consequences. And as Mrs. White and I talked about earlier today, if I do one thing, what are the unintended consequences of that? So I, I just think that it's very important that if we do it, it really has to work and we need to know how it's going to work and fill the holes ahead of time and playing that out. 
versus security theater that's only going to get parents in the school community or students and staff more upset when an incident does happen because we're not not just doing it we're not being able to do it right and airtight I mean even uh, Chief Perkins will talk about the TSA weapons still get through even in those sterile uh, environments so devil's in the details of implementation thank you for that insight um, given us quite a few things to think about here. You mentioned Mr. Freeman. I know that you served for a long time as a principal and assistant principal, so what are some of the practical uh, implications? And I know that that's why a lot of people are tuning in tonight. They want to hear um, kind of the pros and cons when it comes to, to this particular issue. So some insight from your perspective. Well, thank you, Ms. White, and thanks for the opportunity to be here this evening. And uh, Mr. Trump actually made it easier for me because I was just smiling. I said some of the comments he made Number one is our schools are community schools. That's one of the things we have to realize in Roanoke City Public Schools. We try to make sure we give access to our community to make sure that we have that strong partnership. So in the evening time, he made a strong point in the fact that if the machines are cut off during the day, if we have metal detectors, who's manning, manning them in the evening, there's a prime opportunity for individuals to come in and put things in there because our schools are used so much by different organizations. Um, in the daytime, if we start with this um, arrival in the morning, we have to think about the manpower that will be needed there to man at the door, um, number one. Number two, the safety of students that will be lining up to come in through the metal detectors because we have to make sure we're checking each one properly. And if we look at our high schools, we're looking at the largeness of our numbers. Um, we're looking at also the entrances and the exits and how many we'd have to cover. Of course, we have to make sure we have high expectations for our students and having high expectations meaning we have to train them and what the protocol and the procedures will be. So there's a lot of things that, does, that do go into place here when we think about this. Um, a student will only act the way you would want them to act. And I go back to saying that because of the high expectations. Um, serving as the past principal, William Fleming and Woodrow Wilson, we've carried high expectations for all students. And we must maintain the high expectations for all students. We have to consider that, and one of the statements Ms. White uh, mentioned, counselors, social workers, mentors, and SROs who build great relationships with students. That's including teachers, instructional assistants, cafeteria workers, building managers, administrators. That is the key. And we have to continue to build those relationships to maintain a strong presence with our students, with our parents, and especially with our community. Um, I don't have anything else I can make to add, but I, I was, um, I'm glad Mr. Trump led that into the discussion, especially with the man, manning of the doors and making sure that we know our students. And if you know your students when they're coming off the school bus, and I think I take pride in our principals doing so, we automatically know what type of day our students are going to have. Um, and once you build that relationship with them, you know, okay, that this morning you know, they didn't have such a great morning. And it, we, we sometimes have to intercede. And I say, you okay? Go have a good day. Things we build in our relationships. Well, you know, Mr. Freeman, you talked about SROs and you talked about uh, kind of maintaining those relationships and, and all of that. And, and Dr. Lawson mentioned that the school system, and something that you've heard all of us say, the school system is a microcosm of, of our city. And so we do value our partnership with the police department and with the sheriff's department. And so I, I'd like to ask Vice Mayor White Boyd and, and Chief Roman if you could also chime in on Again, this is not just a school system issue, but it is one that I know we're, we're tackling as a city. Um, so what are some of the, the city's approaches to kind of really combating violent crime in the city? I, I am, uh, thank you sure. for, for having me. I'm here in the mayor's place, and, and, and I want to go back, before I um, tackle that question, I want to go back to something Mr. Trump said. Um, he used the phrase security theater. I'm not in security, but what do you mean by security theater? Like, you know, what, what does that mean? And also, we heard, and, and I have to, I would be remiss if I did not ask these questions because I am here in Mayor Lee's place, and Mayor Lee is a, 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 really a strong advocate for metal detectors. So, you know, I would certainly be remiss if I didn't ask the question. But uh, number one, what is security theater? And number two, are there any advantages or any pros to having metal detectors? Because all I've heard so far are the reasons not to do it. And um, I don't know if there are other schools or other regions that have done it. And um, is there any good thing that has come out of it or absolutely not? Because I've not heard any 
anything positive really about metal detectors in this conversation. That's true. Security theater is basically a phrase where you have the perception of increased security, but it's not meeting the actual goal that you have to make a system school safer. It create it solves the emotional uh, the, you know, the parent the heart is parent, I'm a parent. And, and you know, so it, it means oh okay, it's better. They put they have these things at the front door. Uh, and are doing this, so therefore my kid is safer. And that's not necessarily the case if you're not implementing it on a 24-7 on a basis and all these considerations that we're talking about. And around the country, we're seeing schools that are struggling to get bus drivers, cafeteria uh, staff, people who, uh, teachers, uh, who to SROs. Um, I would personally much rather have a strengthened, well-staffed SRO program with the right officer who's proper, who wants to work with kids, who's properly trained, who has with a memorandum of understanding, which I know the district has had with their, their SROs, um, and be, who is a bridge between the school and the community and the violence, and, and because we can measure shootings, it's a lot harder to measure the prevention that's done with the relationships. And the first and best line of defense is a well-trained, highly alert staff and student body. And the number one way we find out about weapons, plots uh, to, to cause harm in school, and self-harm, kids who are uh, threatening self-harm, is from kids who come forward and tell an adult that they trust. And I was really impressed this week as I did the check-in. I should say it's a revisit for me with the, the current administrative team. Um, we just did spot checks uh, with Mr. Perkins and just visits. Like, can I have 10 or 15 minutes with the administrators? And they're in the hallway calling kids by name uh, how you do, and genuinely engaged with kids. And, and as you know, as said, we could, you, you can tell, Mr. Freeman said, you can tell when something is, is off. And a lot of times what we don't quantify or can't quantify is how many things, for example, the school resource officer has, has prevented. People see a school resource officer, they think that's a cuff them and stuff them program so that you're there to arrest students. The best situations with school resource officers is the arrests go down and the relationships and preventative efforts uh, uh, stop. So that's one piece of it is it's nice to say we're doing it, and we're do and and I'm befuddled. By, I've been in schools in this in this country where they run the metal detectors, uh, and they stopped it. I was in one large school district that had metal detectors. They stopped them at 10:30, turned the metal detectors off, had the security officer go down to the lunchroom to manage the lunch, and then the and as, as the head of security and the principal told me, he said, yeah, the gang members come in at, at 11 o'clock because they know they're off at 10:30. So. Are we going to do it? Where do we typically see stationary metal detectors? We see them in, in, in the largest districts in the country, um, LA, Chicago, New York, and we still see incidents where weapons get through. Are there cases where they get them and they catch them? Certainly, there are. But really what we're talking about here is, is a tr and in the second part to follow up on that, um, you know, we see, we do see metal detectors with wands you, uh, used more often at uh, sporting events and other things where you have not just students but a broader community coming in uh, and it, in a controlled space. Um, but we, t we tend not to see them in the vast majority of schools in the country. We don't have hard data. Nobody's collecting that uh, every school district. Um, so are there cases where it, it may be, may prevent something, yes, but they still get through. And the chief will talk about, I'm sure, uh, some data he had from TSA and, and the fail rates on those. Um, and you know, for the people who go down to maybe Disney uh, or uh, Universal Studios, right, and you go through and you have the security officers taking a little wand, kind of sticking, digging through your bags, that's security theater because nobody's getting to the bottom of the diaper bag. Uh, when we're doing that. So for me, I would rather see things that meet the end goal and, and that work because we are in a resource strained uh, piece, uh, you know, reality of this. Uh, so let's put the resources where we, where we are, particularly when, you know, we're often cut elsewhere with counselors, SROs, and things. Well, thank you for that. 
And I appreciate it because I'm sure there were parents also who asked the same question. Mm -hmm. You know, why can't we have metal detectors? So it wasn't just for me or Lee. There might have been a parent. So I'm glad that you took the time to, to expound on that. Um, so back to your question on what is the city doing? What are we doing? Well, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually um, yield to, to, to the chief after I mention some things that, that we've done. And I'm glad that the question was asked because it will give me an opportunity to talk about some of the things that we are trying to put in place. Um, I think we look at it in three areas. I think we've all mentioned the three areas, prevention, intervention, and, and on our side, justice, because that's a piece of it, you know. So for, on the prevention side, um, we're looking at how we can uh, compensate our police officers. Uh, we really need to focus on retention and recruitment. So over the last couple of years, we've done some bonuses and increased the starting pay. Uh, we've also created a step plan uh, in this current budget, uh, which is one of the largest increases um, in decades. Um, so we want to make sure, because we have to compete with surrounding areas. We have to compete with Roanoke County and Lynchburg and, you know, the officers go here and then, you know, you get an increase here and then they go back there. So, you know, we really have to try and stay competitive. Um, but prevention also includes, um, you know, steps to a productive path, uh, which includes, like, recreation for our students. Um, libraries, extending the library hours, we've done that. Um, after school programs, um, the youth employment um, that we've started to help them develop skills, and our gang violence, you know, prevention program, which I'm sure we'll, we'll get into. These are just a few things, you know, some of the things that, that you're going to be doing, Chris, with, with uh, my sorority, um, working with the mothers who've experienced um, the gun violence. And there's a number of programs, and I'm sure um, Mr. Cobb will get into that. But there's also intervention. So we have to, to really work closely with, um, you know, the, the federal law enforcement officers, um, the, the U.S. attorney. I mean, we have to, to work with all of them to make sure that we can um, create joint operations to seize some of these weapons, you know, so that we can um, uh, get a lot of them off the street. But it's not just seizing the weapons. Sometimes we have to um, look at the, uh, the process and working with the U.S. Attorney and the judges because they all have to collaborate and uh, sometimes that doesn't happen in cities, unfortunately. But we, um, and, and at one point, we were, we were there where we, it wasn't intentional. We were just not um, working together. And then we have things like the, um, the reset program. And, and that has really, I think, been effective. And a lot of people say, what is reset? Because we use it a lot. So it's rapid engagement of support in the event of trauma. So the reset team, if there's a, a shooting or, or an act of violence in a community or in a neighborhood, they are deployed immediately. And they go door to door. They don't just go to that individual's home where the accident occurred. They go door to door and they try to, to determine what can we do um, to connect um, our residents with services or what can we do uh, to help them with mental health services, the trauma. And it's not just that home that was impacted, it's that whole community, right, that whole neighborhood. You know, I had um, a lady that used to work for me uh, came down to city council on Monday. Mr. Cobb can attest to this. Uh, she had um, uh, somebody shot through her, her door, I mean, uh, through her wall. And they weren't shooting at her, it was just, you know, uh, straight bullets and so she said for for days she debated whether to sleep in the bed or on the floor so this is the sort of thing that that you know people are dealing with but we are trying our best to to let them know and to make sure they understand that we are here to support them we have services like uh, Ms. Gunn offers you know to try to, to talk to our, our residents so um, there, there's a lot of things that we're doing in and, and we really like to focus on our youth, the mentoring programs. You know, we really want to start early, and I think that we've determined that um, a lot of times it, that's where it needs to start, in the beginning when they're young. So we're working on youth employment um, uh, programs for, for our youth um, and, and the, the library programs, the, the activities that we have for the youth. And then there's justice you know, the, the third piece of it, because, you know, we really have to feel like we're getting some justice when you see your friend shot down. Um, and I know the chief can, can elaborate on that, but we are working with, with 
um, the U.S. Attorney and the judges to not only uh, do a thorough investigation that will lead to um, the, the prosecution and the conviction of, of some of these um, uh, these criminals who, who have conducted, you know, or uh, did these really violent acts. So those are just some of the things that we're working on, and I'm sure that, um, Chief, I will yield the, the little bit of time that you have left <laughs> <laughs> to, to respond to that question. Right, right. Well, first let me say it, it's great to be here, be a part of this discussion. Uh, and everything that Vice Mayor said is, is actually what we're doing, the three tenets, right? Prevention, intervention, and the justice piece. Uh, but when you drill that down to how that relates, I think, to our kids in our school system, in our uh, school division, uh, for us, intervention, we, we quickly realize, we understand it's the foundational value of the police department that in most problems, we cannot arrest our way out of the problems. So we have to be a part of the intervention and the prevention and hopefully never have to get to the justice piece. And so things like prevention and intervention, we, we, we certainly are a part of the mentorship programs, uh, you know, making sure that we are uh, there and providing opportunities and understand the resources that are available. So when our officers come across individuals, whether in a school environment or outside of a school environment, that we understand that arrest is not the only option, right? Uh, how do we interject and interrupt the cycle or the causative factors that go along with some of the violence that we see uh, you know, in our city? And I should also say that what we see in our city is, is not just exclusive to our city. It's indicative of what we're seeing in our state, what we're seeing across the country. Um, so, you know, when I talk with many of my counterparts, the exciting part is to know that we as a city is approaching this problem collectively and comprehensively, that it is just not laid at the feet of law enforcement because we truly understand that this is a community issue. And I am so grateful that we as a city, we're tackling the problem as a community as well. So yes, uh, you know, the directorate for the city has decided that uh, they won't look down the table at the chief to try to solve the problem. The librarian wants to know how can I be a part of the solution, which is why the hours have been extended in the library to provide a safe place for our kids, right? To, uh, movie night on Wednesday nights uh, along with food. Try to meet both the emotional and the physical needs of some of our at-risk uh, kids and hopefully interrupt uh, some of the perpetuating cycles that cause one to lean toward uh, at-risk activity. So I can go on and on and on, <laughs> but those are the things that I'm really most excited about. Of course, we're law enforcement. We will always have to do the justice piece, but I think we are successful as not only an organization, but a community when we don't have to rely so much on the justice piece because we're more successful in the intervention and prevention piece. Thank you for sharing those uh, reflections. And you, you've spoken about the interventions, and one of the things that we noticed in the feedback that we received is that when we asked that question about interventions, sometimes there were gaps there in the spreadsheet uh, where people were not necessarily aware. So we wanted to really pull that out of the feedback and give us an opportunity to talk about these kinds of programs and interventions. We don't want this just to be where we're talking about some of the, the key issues, but we want it to be informative as well. So in terms of internally, it's important for us to also share what we're doing as a school system. You know, you've heard a lot about the interventions and, and uh, relationship building because we, it, it sounds like there's general consensus about the, the necessary aspect of relationships. Certainly that's what I believe. Uh, but we also have to account for not, not only the physical safety of students, but the social emotional safety of our students as well. I'd like Mr. Perkins to talk about the, the, the physical safety of students when it comes to interventions. And Mrs. Poland, if you can talk about the social emotional side. And I know our, our, our time is not long enough here today, but I would like for us to share some of those things that, that we're doing. Yes, of course. Thank you, Ms. White. Mm -hmm. um, it, we want to take a holistic approach. And our district, and I'm very proud of the fact that our district is doing that. And so when it comes to physical safety and infrastructure safety, uh, we all know that it's very dependent upon the human factor. Human beings, our team at RCPS has to be prepared. Mm -hmm. 
They have to have knowledge. They have, so that starts, and we, what we have is, it starts with a layered process. So the first layer that we have in place is emergency management. We've got procedures in place uh, to, to think about, for us to think about prevention, for us to talk about uh, response, reunification or recovery. Those things are very important, and so those, um, those management uh, procedures, emergency management procedures, are critical. But you can't just have procedures. It goes to the, the, the people involved. So you have to have training. And then our second, uh, second phase or second layer is, you know, how do we conduct that training? We can do everything, and we have done everything from tabletops. In fact, Dr. Lawson actually participated in a full-scale drill evaluation of our district in the reunification process. Uh, Mr. Trump has, has participated in tabletop exercises. We brought in the Virginia Department of Emergency Management in March as part of an ongoing series of where we participate with our city emergency manager, our police department, our fire department, our sheriff's department uh, to conduct drills and tabletops and full-scale activities so our team gets that experience with those emergency procedures. And then the third layer is those physical things, that equipment, the things that we have in place. Uh, access control, you know, we, and part of our strategic plan and uh, throughout the history of this uh, school district uh, and working with Mr. Trump, we have increased our access control at all of our schools. When I started, we had 17 schools that had one door at their main entrance. All of our schools now have double entries. So it, 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 we slow down uh, a, a, someone who wants to do harm to our kids. Mm -hmm. uh, all of our main entrances have visitor access security where they have to scan in and it, it checks that person. Is that, that person may be a sex offender. They should not be on a school campus. So we have that in place. Uh, we have, uh, we've enhanced all of our, our video surveillance. Our schools have, and I was in law enforcement for nearly a, a quarter century, and the schools have the best video system of any that I've experienced around the city. And I've seen a lot of surveillance video from the city. So we've increased that. Our okay. communication, our intercom systems, we've upgraded those. We've upgraded our radios. We've upgraded our, our, the system where we can text, email, and call to get emergency notifications out. We, we've done all of that, and we've done a lot of that in the last four years at this district. Uh, we have, we, we look at our schools from the outside in. We use SEPTED, Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design. Our architects work with us. Uh, we work, I work with our landscaping partners to make sure that our bushes are short and our trees are trimmed up. So we have good line of sight as we enter our schools. Bollards to keep cars from running over our kids in playgrounds. But remember, our playgrounds are community assets. Mm -hmm. And so we, we've got to think about that as well. Uh, you know, all of that is supports the human factor. And yes, Ms. Boyd, you ask, uh, is there anything good about a metal detector? There is, and I'll give you an example. Our schools are community schools, but if we can control an event, and I have skilled people trained on how to use a metal detector, like a sporting event, where we can control all the entrances, there is a benefit to having that. Or if there's an identified threat at a particular school, there is a benefit to that. But human beings live up to expectations. What expectation do we set if we have that 24-7? How would you have a town hall, Mr. Cobb? Would, would you have the staff to run our metal detectors so nobody plants something in our school if you had a town hall meeting? How would Council or Delegate Rasul run his town hall just last night? So we've got to balance that. And it's all a balancing act for the physical intervention that, or the physical safety interventions that we have in place. Folks, I could go on and on about what this school district has done, but it's the relationships and it's the human factor that's most important. Our school resource officers have a definite place in our schools. And some may disagree with me. It is not about arresting our kids. In fact, arrest rates have went, it plummeted in our city uh, back when I was chief they were starting to plummet. They have plummeted. Our SROs, when you see them, they run clubs. They go, to, they delivered food during the pandemic. They have built relationships. Our administrators build relationships. Uh, Mr. Trump and I, we were showing up unannounced and principals were out in the halls and they were, they were, they were communicating by radio and they were sending people here and they were doing those things. 
the physical infrastructure is, supports all of that, and it boils down to relationships. And I want Ms. Poland to, to expand on that, that social emotional uh, learning that, that conduct and that mental health supports that go along with those physical interventions that we, we have in place. Uh, and, and I believe it's a holistic approach, and I'm very proud of the team, and I'm very proud of how the district has approached that because it's not about one thing. It's about everything and how it fits in. Thank you, Mr. Perkins, and thank you, Mrs. White, for, for letting us all kind of join together and have a conversation. And it is about the comprehensive approach. It is about those relationships. Everything that you've heard tonight is about how we intervene and prevent crimes in our schools, crimes in our community, and how we're able to, to communicate with one another as well. So when we're talking about interventions and we're talking about prevention, We've got to start with those relationships. You've heard that from, I think, everyone that's spoken so far this evening, but it can't be more true than day-to-day, -day, those basic, how are you, the basic greetings. We, we talked at the beginning of this school year, we developed a responsive lesson plan template, and we talked with our teachers and our administrators and our instructional assistants about how do you set the tone for the day. That, that greeting, that basic greeting can prevent and intervene more than a, a, re, re, a logical consequence or the justice system, right? So we have to get in there and make sure that our staff knows that Maslow's hierarchy of need. Um, we've all kind of talked about it here this evening, but that basic need of our students, are they hungry? Did they have enough food last night? That's how we have to approach our individualized discipline process, our comprehensive approach to our students is making sure we are meeting some of those basic needs and we're reaching out to our community partners to make sure our families are able to have their needs met as well. Just as Ms. Gunn talked about um, having, making sure that our parents are able to put that, that mask on themselves before they can put the mask on, on their child. Um, so we've, we've got some new programs that we're, we're working with the city with Mr. Roberts and the, the Gang Violence Prevention Commission. And then we're also working in our middle schools we've removed some barriers. So we know that our students are crying out for that counseling. So we've worked with Blue Ridge. They have counselors in our middle schools. So we're, we're alleviating some of those pressures from our families to make sure that they do have access to quality counseling and that we know that we can get them there if we need those supports. We also wanna make sure we have tiered systems of supports, right? So we know majority of our students they're okay, they're making it. They might need a, a, a touch point with a counselor here and there. They may need a, a, a trusted mentor. We've got that for the majority of our kids, 75 to 80% of our students, they're okay, they're making it. But we've gotta really focus on those tier two and tier three supports to make sure that we have those tiered interventions and that's where our community partners come in. That's where we have to make sure that our parents and guardians um, that, that they have the support that they need as well to make sure that we're, we're meeting the whole child and the whole family. Thank you for that. And you know, it's, it's important for us to, to bring that kind of awareness of the, the, the kinds of things that we, that we have in place. But I know that another key factor that came out of the feedback and some of the reality of life is that some of our students have, are involved in gangs and gang activity and, um, and parents and many of the parents who gave us feedback wanted to, they, they asked us, they want us to address parent accountability and parents want help with how do, I, how do I know if my child is in a gang? How do I know, how do I get my kid out? And so Mr. Roberts, you wanna kind of elaborate on your work and, and how do we help parents out with this? And then let's talk about the parent accountability piece. Sure, I mean, and thank you for having me here, and I really appreciate you and appreciate the panel, everybody here and all the work they're doing. Um, and I'll kind of echo exactly what we've heard here. We're talking about relationship building. How do we reach our parents? We invite them into the conversation, and we invite them into a transparent conversation, explaining to them exactly the work that we do from a comprehensive lens. You know, like Haley said, how's the family? How are you doing? How are you managing your child? You know, let's have an honest, an honest conversation about that. Where are your weak points at? How can we serve you and increase those weak points? So in our unit, we're looking at it from a comprehensive standpoint, where we're looking at the family, 
and we're looking at it from a top-down and a bottom-up perspective. How do we improve your work environment so you can be home? Can we offer more job skills for the family and the parent or the breadwinner in the home? Can we help you with finding different employment that will give you an opportunity to be at home? We're offering services like that. We're offering more training there from that top-down perspective. From the bottom-up perspective, we're talking to the young person in the home, asking him or her, what exactly do you like to do? What don't you have access to? What doors do you feel like are closed to you? And once we identify that, then we let them know about the resources we have retained to make sure doors open, access is granted, and if not, we create those programs for them. For example, if we're looking at just gang prevention and intervention and suppression and justice, okay, we can see that individual, we can identify that individual who's a part of the gang through our collaboration with RPD, the Sheriff's Office, and the U.S. Attorney's Office. We can identify that individual. So we will treat this individual and, and ask him, or even her, exactly, do, are you prepared to get out and do you have an option? That individual says no, then we provide those options for you, whether it's vocational training, whether it's actually put, being placed in a job, whether it's actually relocating people. We have access to relocate people from this community to different communities, and we will help with that. So we give these options to them and let them decide exactly what you want to do. But we don't stop there because we know that violence just does not touch the perpetrator. What about the one who has experienced the violence? So we have the empathy project. So what we want to do in the empathy project is identify those individuals who have been touched by violence and lost a loved one and feel like no one's remembered them. So what we do, we create art projects and we create spoken word memorializing their life and placing those back in the community so these people would know exactly who's lost, what they meant to someone, and what they meant to this community. So we're doing things like that. We're having access points where we're having mothers uplifting mothers. What better place is there to be when there's all females in a room and there's an older woman there, a gray head in the room that said, baby, what's wrong? That's powerful. You know, that you don't have to be a therapist to do that. You know, and we're talking about healing our community. So if we're talking about that, then let's create these healing circles. We had our first healing circle last week at Eureka Park. People from the community showed up, and the number one question is, what's on your heart? And then we just started having an open conversation about what's going on in the community, what you see in your community, how can you be a part? Everyone's useful. These things spill over into the school. We want to create those healing circles in the schools for the students to talk and support each other, the teachers to talk and support each other. The schools get exactly the best that a parent can see in. Whatever that is, that's the best they can see in that day. You know, and you guys are supposed to fix that. But we got to give you the skill, like Mr. Perkins said, well-trained staff. They got resources. People are working together. If you don't know something, the next person knows that person. Introduce people to these resources. It's just too fashionable to stop at what the gangs look like, how do we identify that, how do we suppress that. Now we're at a point where we're all working together. We're all talking. How do we build bridges? And how do we build bridges to get people's skill sets improved? You know, how do we work together? You know, um, as long as the help is going out and our community is healing, doesn't matter who gets the credit. Doesn't matter. It's just that we know that our community is getting better by creating these access points. Everyone working with everybody and everybody supporting our, our community. So it sounds like everybody keeping their eyes Everybody keeping eyes on, on our kids and everybody know. I mean, we have to know where our kids are. We need to know what they're doing. We need to know where they, you know, there, when I was growing up, and I'm going to date myself, but um, there was a thing, a, a PSA that would come on at 11 o'clock. Anybody else remember this? It's 11 yeah, o'clock. Do you know where your children are? are. <laughs> and so I think some of those kind of old school tactics may be what we're, we're talking about, a return to that. And, and, you know, Mr. Freeman, I'm going to ask you that a lot of the, the feedback also, and, and particularly from teachers, talked about some of this activity, whether or not it's um, the beginnings of gang activity or if it's a kind of a planned fight after school or that kind of thing happens through cell phone usage. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and, you know, it's not just social media, but through text messaging and that kind of thing. Can you just talk to, to us about, a, you know, from your practical experience on the, the use of cell phones in, in classrooms and what happens if we kind of draw that down? Can we draw it down? You know, what would that look like? I think we all can agree that just about every student, just about everybody, has a cell phone. Um, whether they're going to use it for instructional use or personal use or things on social media, 
Um, I know that we, like this White just stated, we have heard from teachers, we've heard from parents. There are some parents that are also concerned about the fact that there are a lot of things that are taking place and being posted on social media, and, and it just says up today we heard some things too. Um, so it is a concern. So what I would like to ask is from our parents first, monitoring what is taking place on social media. Monitor your child's phone. Um, at 2 o'clock in the morning, your student should probably not be on the phone. They should probably be in the bed getting ready for the next day of school. Um, but there are things that do take place on all of these social media outlets, Snapchat, Instagram, and I'm probably outdating myself. There's so many new things that they're using right now. Um, so it's very important, one, that we're monitoring it. Two, that we're supporting the teachers and administrators in the building. Um, there are expectations. We are asking them to use it for instructional use, but afterwards to follow the instructions of the adult in the classroom to put it back away. Um, sometimes there's insubordination that takes place. Um, and then when they want to give a consequence, we'll, we'll fall with opposition. <laughs> and we don't want that. We want to be collaborative in working with everyone. Um, because, you know, we want the student to be, some of them use it for safety purposes, walking home or getting off the bus. So we want them to have access to their phones. But while we're in the school, we want them to utilize it as part of the instructional use, then put it away and be part of the classroom discussion. Um, that's what we're there for. So as we've heard some of those things, that's some of the things that the administrators and teachers want. They want the support in the collaboration and working together. Um, it does bring awareness. It does bring concerns, especially with the social media piece. I think that, you know, and Mr. Roberts, you mentioned the event that just took place. Using that as a positive piece to use that as those students, not basically putting the students out there, but putting it there that it took place. This is what's happening as another area that we can include also in the school system and making sure that some of the representatives are there because our teachers are working hard, the administrators are working hard, and they're trying to use a collaborative approach, but we need everyone working with our parents and everyone at this table on the same page too. I would also ask our parents, you know, I'm not saying I'm not guilty of this, but uh, for our parents, please don't text your kid in the middle of the day. <laughs> <laughs> because it does interrupt instruction. And I'm not saying I've never done it as a parent, but if we could draw that down, that would help. But we do see even kids younger and younger having um, access to cell phones. And I remember when we talked about cell phones uh, just being for emergencies. I remember when I got one, I said it was just before emergency. But, but now it's, it's broader than that. And when it comes to some of the gang activity or some of the disruptive behaviors, we're even noticing more and more of that at the elementary level um, and some of that kind of recruiting at the elementary level. And Colonel Ferguson, I would ask you to kind of chime in here on, you know, the, the use of SROs and our uh, resource officers at the elementary level. What, what have we done? What can we do better? Well, we teach uh, a lot of classes in, in the, on the elementary level. Um, and at face value, they, they sound kind of, not unimportant, but they sound generic. Uh, the D.A.R.E. class, the gang awareness and prevention class, the gun, uh, gun safety class, bicycle safety classes. But embedded within, within the D.A.R.E. curriculum is a lot of really healthy modules that, that we use to try to, to uh, give the, the, the student uh, coping mechanisms for, for, for school and for, for uh, entry into their adult life. Uh, there's things about, uh, you know, obviously drug and alcohol awareness and, uh, and uh, ill effects of such. Uh, but there's also things about uh, modules about dealing with peer pressure, modules about dealing with, with bullying, um, communication skills, um, uh, how to deal effectively with stress. So these are things that are embedded within those modules. Um, but I think the, probably the number, to me, the number one thing that, that uh, SROs provide is a relationship. And that relationship is not just with the student, which is, you know, that is the, 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 the most important, but it's a relationship with, with the teachers, with the school administrators, um, relationships with all the stakeholders here that are, that are, that are present today and, and in the community, but also the relationship with the parents. We get to know the parents. Um, and uh, our SROs, when they're not in the schools, generally speaking, they're, they're working in the courthouse in the juvenile uh, and domestic relations uh, portion of the courthouse. So Mr. Roberts, um, uh, his agency, we, we work hand in hand with them. And it's, it's sometimes um, those relationships come into the courthouse where uh, a student may be in there experiencing the worst day of their life. And they have this relationship that they built 
with an SRO, and it's something that can help. And, and we try to be there to, to bridge those gaps. So relationship building, and then another thing that, that, that I think is really important, and, and the chief and Mr. Trump has touched on it too, is, is those incidents that don't happen. And that's what we're ultimately there for. You know, you, you don't get pats on the back for the incident that don't happen, but, but there, there's quite a few. Uh, there's no way to, mar to mark those, but um, the best problem is the one that doesn't happen. And I think that's part of what we're there for. Well, again, it all starts, that, that prevention starts early. And so we really do appreciate that kind of partnership and support, particularly at the elementary level, um, as uh, kids are kind of, we're teaching early what, what that um, acceptable behavior should look like and then to whom to turn to if our children have um, a problem, if they have a concern. And there, it sounds like around the table, there are multiple um, avenues for that. I do want to address and, and uh, take some time. Another thing that came through, the, the feedback, had to do with the, the Gun Violence um, Prevention Commission. And Councilman Cobb, I know that you had that up. And so can you just give us some of the highlights of, of the commission, the survey that um, was just conducted, and so that the community will be really aware of what, what came out of that survey? Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, identified in the last two years as one of seven localities in Virginia with a high rate of crime, with a high rate of gang violence and youth violence. And so the General Assembly created legislation and then funding to award each of these localities dollars to conduct a youth and gang violence community assessment. We partnered with Elite Business Strategies uh, last fall to conduct this in a very short time frame. Roanoke was the only city to complete the assessment on time. So I commend our community partners for their help mm -hmm. in that. Uh, we learned several things. Uh, we had about a thousand participants in the survey, which was a great uh, turnout. Uh, over 500 of those were community residents from all over the city. Over 250 were students from all over the city. Uh, we had a portion of uh, community leaders who participated in the survey, a, a great diverse cross-section, as well as youth service providers. Because we've realized that if we don't have our youth service providers on board in this effort, uh, we're not gonna be successful. And these are, these include Roanoke City Public Schools, but they're agencies outside of that who are already engaging with, with youth and their families. So a, a couple of things that we learned. Um, while we had a small number of youth who identified with gangs, we were able to learn from those who do why they join gangs. Protection, belonging, source of income, money, entertainment. Those were the four highest ranking areas. And so we're able to take a look at those and identify what can we do from a prevention, intervention, and response strategy to make sure that our youth, starting in elementary school, understand that there are other pathways to achieve that? It's really compelling if you are in a family situation that's very vulnerable, where maybe uh, you have uh, a single parent who is working multiple jobs. You are the oldest child. You're looking after your younger siblings. And you can see the struggle that your parent is going through. And you want to help them face that struggle. And so you're going out looking for, how can I help? How can I bring some cash in? How can I bring some support in? And so if, if that lure, if the allure is there, and this kind of false sense of relationship, then because you want to help your family survive, I can see the inclination to want to respond to that. It takes extraordinary uh, courage and will to say, no, mm -hmm. I think I'll go over here. So, so at an early age from a social emotional learning perspective, we wanna make sure that we're supporting our families and our schools to make sure our children know how to navigate that. So one of the things we've uh, just launched is a uh, program, a curriculum called Connecting in the Star City which is a social emotional violence prevention curriculum. Family Service Veronic Valley created this curriculum. We are partnering with a, a number of after school programs and making this available to the children and youth as well as their parents. 
These are short lessons, but they can be incorporated into any program that exists, whether it's a dance program, a recreation program, an educational program. Another thing that we learned was that youth want to understand who they are. Mm -hmm. They want to understand their identity and their purpose and their culture. Mm -hmm. So when we have classes like the African American culture and contemporary issues at William Fleming, we want to take that model and multiply it through as many schools as we can. Because when you go from a class that was drawing maybe 12 young African American men, good class, it's been solid for decades in a partnership with TAP, and you see the, the demand for that increase in the last two years from 12 to over 70, and there's a waiting list, that says to me, this is working. So how can we as a community support that and support Roanoke City Public Schools to expand that? So they're looking for these ways to uh, have that sense of identity and culture. And when we did a recent round table with a group of these students, one of the things that several of the young men specifically said was, we need to acknowledge the influence we have as young men over our, not only our peers, but our younger siblings. They are watching us. Yeah. If we are sitting in the park littering, they say, it's okay. If we're sitting in the park smoking or vaping, it's okay. We have to be aware of our behaviors and our responsibility. And these are from students who, when they started this class, could have cared less. Mm -hmm. But the transformation they experience has made that difference. Another thing from the community that we learned, and we heard this from youth and the community, and that is the question was posed, do you feel safer in your neighborhood, in your city, than you did two years ago? We didn't drill down to ask what the reasons were. Over 85% of everyone polled said, I do not feel safer now than I did two years ago. Now, students said they generally feel safe in school. And they feel as though there are teachers, counselors, administrators that they can talk to if they have a problem. And the majority of those students also said they have a good relationship with their parents. But the compelling thing that emerged from the survey was we want to have that relationship with our peers. So any kind of peer support programs that we can support in our schools, in our neighborhoods, in our after school programs. The students are ready for that, and they're ready to do the training. They're ready to have that responsibility. And I will tell you, my eighth grade daughter, we were talking recently about communication. And we were, we were saying, well, you know, you have this ability outside of school to text your friends. And she said, Papa, I don't want to text my friends. I want to talk with my friends. There's a huge difference, and we've got to change that narrative and change that practice. And me as a parent, I need to change that. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to just do this when we can do this and have a face-to-face -face conversation. So the last couple of things I'll, I'll just add on this is, um, and, and we talked about supporting parents. When we, when we just emphasize youth and young adults and forget the parents, we're missing out on mm -hmm. an important piece. Many of our parents don't know what to do. Yep. They are doing everything they can to be a parent, to make ends meet, to deal with the burdens and stresses, and they are exhausted. And so we need to find a way to support them in a meaningful way to bring healing mm -hmm. when it's necessary and important. Mm -hmm. Because the level of trauma in our community is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And so we have worked with partners to actually have counselors on site in some of our housing communities. Uh, we, are, uh, we are working to expand access to counseling and trauma-informed care without the barriers of not having insurance or not being able to pay. Um, we are, we've launched a reading program because we know that the ability to read by third grade means you your chance to succeed through graduation and beyond is critical. And with some of the learning loss over the last two years, we've started a reading mentoring program at Lincoln Terrace 
over 30 volunteers, over 60 kids involved. Um, we've started a 100 community peace builders conflict resolution training for people in neighborhoods to be able to be trained to, um, we don't want to get, we don't want them to be in the middle of violence, but we want them to recognize when conflict is happening and when it might be escalating and how to de-escalate it. We are getting ready to do a comprehensive gun violence reduction marketing campaign throughout the entire city. And we're gonna be reaching out to all of our community partners to make sure we're all on the same page with that and that it's done in a meaningful way. And then uh, finally, I would just add, I cannot say enough about uh, our youth and gang violence prevention team and the collaboration with Roanoke City Schools. Because the more we can build relationships with our students and their families, the more we will see the transformation take place. Um, I, I wanna close with one other thing, and, and I apologize if I'm going a little too long, but I could talk for hours about this. Mm -hmm. um, Friday night, I did a ride along with our police department. We have an extraordinary police department. And one of the first calls was a shots fired call in a very vulnerable neighborhood in our city. And I had the opportunity to visit with families. And a after everything was deemed safe, there were 50 children running around, families talking about their exhaustion mm -hmm. about this gun violence, mm. literally exhausted. I just came home from work. Here we go again. Mm -hmm. Two weeks ago, it happened. We all feel that exhaustion. And so part of our task as a community, and everyone has to be involved in this, is how to restore that sense of safety and the reality of safety. Mm -hmm. And it takes all of us, I think, waking up mm -hmm. and saying, what am I gonna do today mm -hmm. to be the best person I can be? What do I need? Who do I need? And how can I help somebody today mm -hmm. to restore that sense of safety? If all of us take that responsibly, and I know not all of, us, all of us are in the same place, but we don't want just some parts of our city to be safe. Mm -hmm. We want our whole city to be safe, and we've got to do that together. Absolutely, thank you um, for that and for sharing those um, highlights from the commission um, with us. I've been taking some copious notes, and I just want to thank the public for hanging in there with us as well, um, because I know that we've run over time a bit, but. Have we really? I think this has been a rich yeah. discussion uh, and an important discussion. And one, to me, it sounds like we're not finished with and that we can't just leave it here. So I've taken a few notes um, here, some of the, the common themes from this, this dialogue tonight, having uh, community support, um, the importance of those relationships, and um, really having a community approach to all of this. Um, I have to put my glasses on so that I can read my own writing. Uh, but to really going back and, and reteaching, spending some time reteaching those um, acceptable behaviors, um, particularly due to the pandemic, uh, when it comes to our students, making sure that we're not taking for granted that students automatically know uh, what we mean by, um, by acceptable behavior. Um, maintaining that comprehensive approach um, if, you know, again, there are time, there's a time and place for metal detectors, perhaps the sporting events and those kinds of things, but if we're going to talk about that and we have to look at the entire, all of the complexities related to not just that, but the equipment, whether or not we're talking about metal detectors or wands or clear bags or no bags or limiting cell phone uses, usage, those are all strategies that I think we, they're, they're complex. And so uh, what I heard Mr. Trump you say is that if we're going to look at any one of those or all of those, then we have to consider all of the complexities related to those strategies. Uh, other things that I heard uh, tonight in terms of maintaining highly trained staff um, and student body, maintaining our SRO program, um, especially the mentoring aspect of the SRO program, I heard uh, be an example, all of us have to be an example. And I think we uh, have some shining examples right here in Roanoke City. Maintaining our after school programs, um, looking at classes that 
um, have had an impact like the Inf African American culture classes mm -hmm. and looking at uh, conflict resolution training. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that we can maintain or even do better. And so I do want to take some time and thank uh, each of our panelists. Uh, thank you for this thoughtful discussion and for taking your time. I want to thank our community as well for, for tuning in and for sharing um, with us in this dialogue and discussion. We want to be transparent. Uh, we are putting our best foot forward for our students, every single person, not just around this table, but all of our staff members as well on a daily basis. Our parents, again, again our parents, <coughs> excuse me, bring, give us the best they have. So, now I'm gonna, <laughs> hold on a second. Anyone else? Um, I, I, I <coughs> want to stress one other thing that we heard is just um, for those uh, folks who are so pro uh, metal detectors, I think we also want to be clear about the, and so who hear relationships and all of the things we need to do and hear well, we're doing all these things and still a child brought a gun in. Um, that was one time or a couple of times we don't hear about all of the things mm -hmm. that all of that are prevented from happening, mm -hmm. all the good work we're doing that are preventing the other events that could happen. And so, mm -hmm. I th thank you for making that point. Um, and uh, just, I think what I learned tonight, I heard on a, I saw on a Facebook post that we're not all in the same boat, but we are all in the same storm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, you all are helping us navigate um, through this storm so that we can get safely, our students safely through, our staff um, and our community. So mm -hmm. thank you for your time and here And thank tonight. you for that. And I guess if I'm losing my voice, it's time to stop. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I do think that <clears throat> actions speak louder than words. And so it's incumbent upon all of us to take action. Some of the things we can do immediately, sometimes some things will take more time. And so I'd like to, um, to just share some of the things that I think that we can do in the immediate. One of the things that came out of the survey is that students do want to earn a little income and want to be able to help out. And so we are uh, beginning an RCPS works program. We know that many of our local employers uh, need employees. So we're going to have a job fair for our students. Uh, and so we give our students something productive to do, ways to earn a little money, and hopefully help out our employers in the city as well. Um, as mentioned earlier, we already have a bullying hotline, um, but please remember that if you, you know, see something or if, you're, if you believe your child is being bullied, there are measures that we can take. Certainly if you know of something egregious and something that is um, truly problematic or a, s a real safety issue, 911 is first. Uh, and, and then, uh, of course, if your child is being bullied, we are here in person and that hotline is always available. We will again be sending home with all students the Family Safety Pledge. Uh, we encourage you to read over this uh, pledge with your students and, and read over it together so that, again, we can kind of recommit to making both our homes and our schools uh, safe havens for, uh, for our students and for our families to be. To our parents and guardians, if you have a firearm or other weapon at home, please take the necessary measures to make sure that it is secure and not uh, easily accessible by any minors in your home. We will also be sending home a resource for obtaining gun safety locks. Again, something that we can do in the immediate to ensure uh, that type of safety. Additionally, please have conversations with your child about the logical consequences of behavior that does not comply with the student code of conduct. Additionally, if you feel that your student needs help to appropriately resolve conflicts, um, please know that our counselors, our social workers, and other student support staff are available for that type of support. If parents and guardians are interested in additional supports from the city's youth and gang violence prevention coordinator, Mr. Roberts, uh, we will be posting his information uh, on the Safety Summit uh, page of our division's website. And so we as a school division are actively recruiting to ensure that we have 
the counselors, we have the social workers, we have the teachers, we have the staff members. We're in a people business. And so we need people for our young people. Uh, as you heard, it's about relationships. So we are um, investing in, uh, in our people and we want to thank our, our school board for that type of investment. Um, and because that's in our budget proposal, we have we're proposing you know, we've proposed 34 additional positions, um, school-based uh, positions, so that our schools and our, our students have someone to connect to and with. So finally, to everyone in the community um, who and who has joined us today, as well as our panel. Um, we, we encourage you also to volunteer in our schools, um, become a mentor, tutor a student. Uh, again, it takes all of us working together to get this done. <coughs> and before we close, I'd like to thank everyone again. RVTV, thank you. And we're gonna close here tonight. <laughs> How do you apologize? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> If you could finish it for me, because my <laughs> voice is not going to hold out. Um, we thank you to everyone who took the time to provide your input. Um, to our teachers, administrators, and our CPS staff, thank you for your input and for all you do every day in support of our students. To our panelists, um, we are so appreciative of your time, your expertise, and your openness as we dug into this difficult uh, conversation this evening. And this is just the beginning. As we just That's right. It. <laughs> uh, so I speak on behalf of the board in saying <coughs> that um, the administration and the board uh, will use the information we've gathered tonight um, to help inform our path forward. To our friends here at RV TV, thank you so much for making the summit possible. Thank you for bearing with us. Uh, we will be posting a schedule of when this evening's program will re-air on RVTV on the RCPS website. Uh, and thank you to everyone who tuned in this evening. Uh, and thank you to Mrs. White. And thank you, Mrs. <laughs> Smith, for pinch hitting uh, here and for, for filling in the gaps. And again, thanks to all of you. That, you know, when we say we are one, that has to be more than a slogan for us. And you can see it's evident tonight. We are one and we are a proud city and we are Brunswick City Public Schools. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Have a great evening.